The church invites us on the first Sunday of Lent to step out, to walk with Jesus into the wilderness. When Luke wrote his gospel, he was very familiar with the Old Testament, and he would have been conscious of how God used Moses and freed his chosen people from slavery in Egypt. In order to form his chosen people, he had to bring them out of Egypt into the wilderness. That's why we have the, the wonderful verse from Scripture, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Jesus is also fully conscious of those scriptures. Being a good and faithful Jew, he would have heard these stories over and over. And in his own infancy, he too was called out of Egypt. And now, in his person, he takes on the entire personality of the chosen race. For they who were called by God to be formed by him in the wilderness, albeit for 40 years, we now see the approved Son of God, this is my Son, the Beloved, now being led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be formed for 40 days. Beloved, when we choose to step out with the Lord in the wilderness, we learn an important truth. That in the wilderness, we no longer depend on ourselves and our resources. We depend on the power and strength of our God. When God calls each of us to step out with Jesus, he's saying, leave everything behind, all the safety nets you have, and learn how to depend on me in the wilderness, in the aridity, in the reality of facing just sun and sand Learn how to trust in my power. For the way I provided for my chosen people in the wilderness for 40 years is the way I will provide for you if you choose to walk with my son. And as Jesus enters the wilderness, we learn and hear that he is tempted by the devil. Since we are walking with the Lord during these days of Lent, perhaps we can ask ourselves, how do we come to a deeper realization of who God is and therefore what it means for us who step out into the wilderness? What can we learn about God and ourselves, especially in light of the temptations of Jesus Christ? The first, we are told that Jesus fasted for 40 days. When you fast, beloved, what's going to happen? You're going to get hungry and trust me, nothing seems more appealing than that which you choose to give up for Lent. If you choose to give up, say, chocolate cake, the strange irony is that wherever you go, you're going to find chocolate cake on the table. If you happen to pass the bakery, the chocolate cake will smell really, really good. If you choose to give up anything else for Lent, you may find that you are constantly teased to break it. Jesus was invited by the devil to break his fast. He says, you're hungry? Why? Why do you want to stay hungry? Did not your heavenly father feed the people in the wilderness? They didn't have to fast. Why should you fast? But Jesus was centered on his mission. He knew what he was about. He was led by the Spirit, and the Spirit invited him to fast for 40 days. And he was not going to break it based on the devil. He would do so when his father approved it. And so what do we have happening? We have Jesus who chose to fast because he had a mission to bring life to the world. Beloved, when you and I choose to fast, as we should during the season of Lent, we should always be conscious that it's not just the act of fasting that should be the penance. Fasting should be married to prayer and almsgiving. When you and I fast, we should ask ourselves, from what do we fast? The meal item. And can I then consider whatever it is I would have spent on that particular meal or item, can I now give it to someone else who is hungry? The fasting should lead to generosity. When Jesus chose to fast, he was giving the Spirit more room in his life so that he could be more centered and faithful on the mission at hand. 
he could have changed the stone into bread. You and I can break our fast at any time. But if we walk with Jesus, we will have the strength and courage to do what God asks of us. It is a good thing to give to someone in need. Beloved, it's a better thing to anticipate what the needs are and be preemptive in reaching out. So it's a good thing if someone comes and says, I am hungry, can I get something to eat? And you respond. It's a better thing if you see someone in need and without waiting for that person to ask, you preempt the person and say, I see that you need something here. I hope this will help for the moment. Who is our God? God says, before you were born, I knew you. Therefore, when we come to God with our needs and ask, God, who is good, will always provide for our needs. But this same God, beloved, even before we ask, even before we turn to him in prayer, this same God who has already put things and structures and all that we will ever need in place so that all our needs can be met. And therefore, when we are invited to walk into the wilderness and divest ourselves of anything that we may find to be a safety net, we are learning how to commit to a God who will always be there to give us all that we need in every moment, and if we choose to fast, to give us the strength to endure whenever the temptation comes to break it. Our God is good. All we have to learn to do is surrender and trust in his power, which then leads us to the second temptation. As Jesus then says, I feed on the word of my Father, and therefore I listen to him and respond to what he wants, not what you want. The devil then shows him the various kingdoms of the world. And the devil probably said to him, Oi, you see all of this? It can be yours. Nobody has to know if right here, right now, you acknowledge me as your God. It'll be between you and I. And guess what? I will give you all the power, the wealth, and the popularity that you will ever need. The devil probably had amnesia, beloved. Because what do we know about Jesus from Scripture? We are told that Jesus had all the glory and adoration he would ever need when he was with his Father in heaven. But according to Philippians, Jesus chose to divest himself of all of that. He chose to empty himself to become one of us. To become one like us, so that through him who is with us, we may all attain eternal salvation. What's the truth? God blesses us with everything. But as Jesus shows, the only thing that truly gives full satisfaction is God's presence in our lives. If it is true that all the wealth and all the popularity and all the adoration that we may get from people satisfies. Why do we hear of so many people who have all these things all of a sudden become drug addicts, become victims of alcohol abuse, or sad to say, sometimes even take their own lives? There's a place made in each of us that only God can satisfy. And so it's not about how much we have or how much we are missing It's how are we inclined to keep drawing close to God in prayer so that God may truly reveal how much he fully satisfies us amidst all the various blessings of life. How well do we use the time we have to make sure we spend time with God? How well do we apply ourselves and our energy to pursue that which is necessary for life, but in the midst of all that busyness, do we still find the time for God who fully satisfies? Lent is a wonderful time when we should hear the Lord saying, I know you've been busy. I know you have excuses, valid and sometimes strange. And therefore, I know that you've been running all over the place. But come back to me, for I'm waiting on you. Come back to me with all your heart. Come to me in prayer and let me satisfy your deepest longing desires. For I am the God who knows you more than you know yourself. And it's in me and with me and through me that you will have full satisfaction in life. 
which then leads us to the third and final temptation. As Jesus reveals that only God truly satisfies and not the kingdoms of the world, but the kingdom of God, the devil takes him up on the parapet of the temple. The devil says to him, throw yourself down. For after all, doesn't scripture say you will be protected? The devil quotes scripture too, notice. That's why Paul says, be careful. Always discern. Don't just jump and do the spontaneous action. Take time to think. Take time to ponder. Take time to reflect. And Jesus responds with scripture. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Fast forward. When the disciples saw how intimate Jesus was with his father, they said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he taught them the Our Father. And what's that beautiful line from the Our Father? Do not bring us to the test, or the modern translation, which you now use in Mass, lead us not into temptation. You know why we shouldn't put God to the test? Because we're going to be tested, whether we want it or not. Whether we like it or not, we are going to be tested. We don't need to add more to what's already in life. When students are asked to sit exams, and they are tested. They are not tested on what they don't know. They are tested on what they do know. I rather like a meme I received a few weeks ago. When you and I are tested, we are tested not to show our weakness. We are tested to reveal our strengths. So when we are tested and we are able to overcome the strength that is ours, which comes from God, we should give thanks. When we are tested and we fail and fall, because we're all too frail and weak, we should turn to our God who is our strength and ask him to lift us up, take us up out of the dirt, and help us to walk in that journey of continuous faith. Beloved, the church is not a place of saints. It's a place for people who want to become saints, meaning we recognize that we are sinners, but during the season of Lent, we are called by the Lord to look within, to journey with him, to see our weaknesses, to place them before him and ask him for the courage and strength to know them, to own them, and then to walk away from them. When we choose to walk away from that which is not of God, God reveals his love and mercy even more in our lives. At the two previous masses, someone said to me, Father, I noticed you didn't mention cricket. I said to them yesterday morning when we had a ministry meeting, I made a pledge we wouldn't talk about cricket for the weekend. Now I have to break that pledge. We all know what happened to the West Indies. If you don't know what happened, say thank God. Cricket? points to life. Some days we win, some days we lose. In the West Indies case, some days we lose badly. But look on the bright side. Having hit another new low, there's only one way to go, which is up. <laughs> That's life. Sometimes we will hit lows and we wonder, does God or people love me anymore? But God is full of mercy and compassion. What did we hear in yesterday's gospel as the people attacked Jesus for daring to sit with Levi, the tax collector, and sinners? What was Jesus' response? Jesus says, I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance. I came to call sinners. God does not desire anyone to die because of sin. That is why even before we asked for a savior, God the Father had the plan to send his son who would say yes to die so that you and I can be forgiven and be saved. Even before we ask for forgiveness, turn to the Lord. When we turn to God, we will see that he never ever abandons us. And this is what Jesus reveals to each of us as we try to listen to his voice during the season of Lent. That we who feed on him, who is the word and bread of life, that we who trust in his saving power when any temptation comes our way, if we learn how to surrender, 
how to walk with him, how to walk away from things that are not of his word nor his kingdom, you and I will truly become sons and daughters in whom our God is well pleased. Have courage, beloved. Ask for the graces we need so that as we journey through this season of Lent, we will look forward to Easter joy and the hope of eternal life. To our God of life, love and joy, be glory and praise forever and ever.